Hello everyone and welcome to another video on building serverless applications on AWS with .NET. In this video, we're going to talk about concurrency. One of Lambda's superpowers is its ability to scale. And it does that even though each execution environment can only process one request at any one time. And it does that by having lots and lots of concurrent execution environments. In fact, up to a thousand by default in your AWS account, and that limit can be raised if you need to. Now with Lambda, there's two different types of concurrency. The first is provisioned concurrency. And provision concurrency allows you to keep a certain number of warm execution environments available at all times. So if you have a pretty consistent workload against your Lambda function, provision concurrency can be a great way to ensure you always have execution environments available. The trade-off being you lose that scale to zero that you get with Lambda by default because you've got these constant execution environments, there is a cost implication to that. The other concurrency option you have with Lambda is reserved concurrency. Now, as I said, by default, you get a thousand concurrent executions in your AWS account. And what reserved concurrency allows you to do is to control the number of concurrent execution environments available for a given Lambda function. So if I set my reserved concurrency to two, the Lambda function in question will only ever be allowed to have two execution environments at any one time. Why would we want to do these things? Well, let's dive into some code now and have a look at both of these options. So what we've got is a really simple Lambda function that is just going to run a scan request against a DynamoDB table. It's gonna parse the results of the scan to a list of products and just return an API response. So it's a really simple Lambda function that we can use to kind of prove out what some of these um, features do within Lambda. And just to kind of set the context here, if I just flip over to the AWS console, I've just run a request against this Lambda function um, and introduced a cold start. And here are the numbers we've got. So we've got an init duration of about 400 milliseconds. And then we've got an actual execution duration of 2.8 seconds. Now this might sound a lot, and this can sometimes be caused by things like the AWS SDKs needing to do a TLS handshake on the first request. Jitting is also something that can cause a bit of a slowdown. So this is the benchmark we've got. But the first request with a cold start with this Lambda function is 2.8 seconds. Now let's see what happens if we go off and enable provision concurrency in this function, and then also add some additional features to our function code to try and improve that initial start. We go back over to our IDE now, enabling provision concurrency is actually really easy, especially if you're using AWS SAM. So in my SAM template, the first thing I need to do is add an alias to my Lambda function, and you can only apply provision concurrency to versions of your Lambda function. So that means we need to enable aliases. I'll link to another video that I have on aliases and versions in the description below. And then the second thing we need to do to configure provision concurrency is to add some configuration in here. And all that looks like is if I just grab some temp, some YAML from over here and paste that in there, it's just really simple. We just add this provision concurrency config property. And then we just say how many execution environments we want. In this case, I only want one provisioned execution environment. And that's so that we can just see what happens just with one single environment. Now what happens when I enable provision concurrency is that once I deploy the new version of this Lambda function, my execution environment will be created there and then. So one single execution environment. So if we look back at the function code now, you see I've got these, these console write lines in my actual function constructor. And if we look at the existing um, the existing CloudWatch logs, you can see the logs from the constructor happened at the same time as my request was received. So the first request was received into the function, it ran the init phase, and then it actually handled the request. What's actually gonna happen when I deploy this with provision concurrency enabled is we'll actually see this console write line in constructor and console write line constructor finished before any requests are received. 
Now, the other thing I'm actually going to do here is I'm actually going to make a request to with DynamoDB, and I'm going to make that to the describe table um, endpoint, and that's not actually going to do anything. Um, it's just going to give me some details back about my DynamoDB table, and then I'm just going to write another message to the console, just saying table ARN is um, table dot table dot table dot table ARN. So then we actually get our ARN in our logs. Now the reason I'm doing this is that initial creating a new instance of my DynamoDB client doesn't necessarily make any connections to the DynamoDB API. If I run this describe table request at this point, that will actually perform the TLS handshake, it will set up the connection, and then when my actual request comes in to perform this scan, there will be an existing connection already there to the DynamoDB APIs. So let's deploy this now to, um, to AWS Lambda. If I just bring my terminal back over here, I can run a SAM build to just build my new Lambda function. And then I can run a SAM deploy to push that out to AWS. If you're not familiar with AWS SAM, I'll put a link in the description to a playlist I have on YouTube for using AWS SAM with .NET. And then I can run a SAM deploy and that will now go off and deploy my Lambda function. So that's deployed now, and if we just flip back over to the um, AWS, the console for a second and look at CloudWatch logs. So this request here against latest is the one we were just looking at that had um, the logs and the request. Now you see I've got all these other CloudWatch log groups now before I've actually sent any requests to my API. And if I go into one of these log groups, you can see these are the logs from my constructor. So what's happened is the initialization phase of my Lambda function is executed before a request has been received. So you see I've got my constructor, I've got my AR and my table, and then I've got the constructor finished message. If I actually go ahead and make a request against my API endpoint now, you see that returns quite quickly. That was definitely not 2.8 seconds. And if we come back to CloudWatch now, we can actually go and find the logs for that specific request. Now this is where things do get a little bit tricky sometimes because these execution environments already exist, the logs for that request will be in one of these existing CloudWatch log groups. So we just need to find the right log group and then that will give us our request. There we are. So you can see that this, um, the actual constructor ran at 11.15, but then we actually received the request right now at 11.24. And if we look at our um, durations here, you see the init duration does look a little bit weird when this first request came in because this is including the constructor from earlier. But if we look at our actual duration, our execution duration, that's 895 milliseconds. That's a full two seconds faster than if we were using um, not using provision concurrency and just allowing a normal cold start to happen. If we now take hit another request against the API now, if we just hit a few more, we should see a pretty consistent response time. Sometimes you will find that the initial request that's received is slightly slower than the, the, the following ones, and that can be explained by things like jitting, um, other connections being set up in your Lambda function. So there's a few other things that can cause that to slow down. So you see we've got our 800 milliseconds there, which is still two seconds faster than with a cold start but then every request thereafter is in the order of double digit milliseconds. So there is still a slight difference in performance, but if you optimize your code in the right way, you can get a much faster time for your initial request in a given execution environment. So let's have a look at reserved concurrency now. And to kind of demonstrate reserved concurrency, I'm just gonna change this function called some more. I'm just gonna introduce a delay here. And I'm going to put a delay of um, four seconds, and I'm going to put in a three second delay in this Lambda function. And this will allow me to demonstrate how reserve concurrency kind of manifests itself when you're actually making requests to your Lambda function. So to enable reserve concurrency, we do that in much the same way as provision concurrency. We can do that against in our SAM template. What I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the provision concurrency configuration and I'm actually going to add this reserved concurrent executions property and I'm going to set that to one. And what I'm saying here is that I only want to allow one execution environment to ever be available at any one time. Now because Lambda guarantees that each execution environment will only process one request at any one time, what this setting actually does 
is that as it only allows our Lambda function, in this case our API, to be processing one API request at any one time. Now, of course, you're probably not going to want to do this in production in this specific way for this specific scenario, but this will just give us a really good demonstration of what happens with reserve concurrency when you set that up. So I've just set that reserve concurrent executions to be one now, and I'm going to go off and deploy a new version of this function. So if I just pull my terminal back up, I'm just going to clear that. I'm going to sand build again. This will go off. I can compile my function. And then we can run a sand deploy. I'll just pause the video while that goes off and deploys, and we'll come back in just a sec. Okay, so that has finished deploying now. And if we just have a quick look in the AWS console and the configuration for this function, you can see that we have reserve concurrency enabled, and our reserve concurrency is set to 1. Now, if I come back to my API endpoint now, and I'm just going to hit my API endpoint, and then again in a second window, and you can see while this first request is still running, I got an internal server error on this second tab. If I refresh this second tab, now that my first tab has completed, we get success. Superb. If I refresh that and that request is running and request my second tab, I get an internal server error there. And that internal server error is caused by that reserved concurrency configuration. Now, you might be thinking, why would I actually want to configure reserved concurrency? All I'm doing is limiting my Lambda function and how it can scale. Well, there's a, there's, there's, there's a number of different reasons you might want to do that. The first is cost. If you want to control the potential cost of a Lambda function, you can configure reserved concurrency, right? So then if you're hit with a sudden flood of traffic, you can control the maximum cost that can, that can give you. And that also applies to security. If you were to be hit with a DDoS attack, for example, configuring reserved concurrency will limit the radius and the cost implications of that attack. Things like scalability, if you've got a Lambda function in front of a, a database running on RDS, for example, you might want to limit the um, execution environments, therefore connections to that database behind the scenes, because maybe that database can't handle the scalability of Lambda. So maybe you've got some downstream service that you need to limit the executions against. And finally, you can use reserve concurrency to effectively switch off a Lambda function. If I was to set reserve concurrency to zero, that's me telling Lambda you can't have any execution environments at all. And in that case, you've effectively turned your Lambda function off. So there's a few different use cases for reserve concurrency, and it's really quite a powerful configuration. Provision concurrency is quite a clear um, use case. If you've got a consistent workload and you need a really predictable latency, provision concurrency can give you that. Albeit with the slight cost implications and the fact that your lambdas will no longer scale to zero. That's Lambda Concurrency. If you have any questions, as always, please comment below, reach out on social media. If you like the video, then please like, please subscribe, and I will see you next time.